Chapter 4, Part 3 From time to time he saw a fight, though he could make out no objects in it, and sometimes when they made entrance into his heart it seemed to him as though a flame, as of a lighted candle, blazed up strongly and happily in his heart, and rushing outward through his throat flooded him with light, and in the light of this flame he could see even far off things. This did indeed happen once. We were walking through a forest and he was silent, wholly given up to prayer. Suddenly he said to me, What a pity. The church is already on fire. There the belfry has fallen. Stop this vain dreaming, I answered. It is a temptation to you. You must put all such fancies aside at once. How can you possibly see what is happening in town? We are still seven or eight miles away from it. He obeyed me and went on with his prayer in silence. Toward evening we came to the town, and there was a matter of a fact I saw several burnt houses and a fallen belfry, which had been built with ties of timber, and the people crowding around and wondering how it was that the belfry had crushed no one in its fall. As I worked it out, the misfortune had happened at the very same time as the blind man spoke to me about it, and he began to talk to me about the matter. You told me, said he, that this vision of mine was vain. But here you see things really as I saw them. How can I fail to thank and to love the Lord Jesus Christ, who shows his grace even to sinners and the blind and the foolish? And I thank you also for teaching me the work of the heart. Love Jesus Christ, said I, and thank him all you will. But beware of taking your visions for direct revelations of grace. For these things may happen often, quite naturally, in the order of things. The human soul is not bound by place and matter. It can see even in the darkness and what happens a long way off, as well as things near at hand. Only we do not give force and scope to the spiritual power. We crush it beneath the yoke of our gross bodies and get it mixed up with our haphazard thoughts and ideas. But when we concentrate within ourselves, when we draw away from everything around us and become more subtle and refined in mind, then the soul comes into its own and works to its fullest power. So what happened was natural enough. I have heard my departed starrets say that there are people, even such as are not given to prayer, but who have this sort of power or gain it during sickness, who see light even in the darkest of rooms as though it streamed from every article in it and see things by it, who see their doubles and enter into the thoughts of other people. But what does come directly from the grace of God in the case of the prayer of the heart is so full of sweetness and delight that no tongue can tell of it, nor can it be likened to anything material. It is beyond compare. Every feeling is based compared with the sweet knowledge of grace in the heart. My blind friend listened eagerly to this and became still more humble. The prayer grew more and more in his heart and delighted him beyond words. I rejoiced at this with all my soul and thanked God from my heart that he had let me see so blessed a servant of his. We got back to Tobolsk at last. I took him to the almshouse and leaving him there with a loving farewell, I went on my way. I went along without hurrying for about a month with a deep sense of the way in which good lives teach us and spur us on to copy them. I read the Philoclea a great deal and there made sure of everything I had told the blind man of prayer. His example kindled in me zeal and thankfulness and love for God. The prayer of my heart gave me such consolation that I felt there was no happier person on earth than I, and I doubted if there could be greater and fuller happiness in the kingdom of heaven. Not only did I feel this in my own soul, but the whole outside world also seemed to be full of charm and delight. Everything drew me to love and thank God, people, trees, plants and animals. I saw them all as my king's folk. I found on all of them the magic name of Jesus. Sometimes I felt as light as though I had no body and were floating happily through the air instead of walking. Sometimes when I withdrew into myself, I saw clearly all of my internal organs and was filled with wonder and wisdom at which the human body is made. Sometimes I felt as joyful as I had been made sar. And at all such times of happiness, I wish that God would let death come to me quickly and let me pour out my heart in thankfulness at his feet in the world of spirits. It would seem that somehow I took great joy in these feelings, or perhaps it was just allowed by God's will, but for some time I felt a sort of quaking and fear in my heart. Was there, I wondered, some new misfortune or trouble coming upon me like what had happened after I met the girl again, to whom I taught the prayer of Jesus in the chapel? A cloud of such thoughts came down upon me, and I remembered the words of the Venerable John of Kapathos, 
who says that the master will often submit to humiliation and endure disaster and temptation for the sake of those who have profited by him spiritually. I fought against the gloomy thoughts and prayed with even more earnestness than ever. The prayer quite put them to flight, and taking heart again I said, God's will will be done. I am ready to suffer whatever Jesus Christ sends for me, my wickedness and pride. And those whom I had lately shown the secret entry into the heart and interior prayer had even before their meeting me been made ready by the direct and secret teachings of God. Calmed by these thoughts, I went on my way again, filled with consolation, having the prayer with me, and happier even than I had been before. It rained for a couple of days, and the road was so muddy that I could hardly drag my feet out of the mire. I was walking across the steppe, and in ten miles or so I did not find a single dwelling. At last, toward nightfall, I came upon one house standing by itself right on the road. Glad I was to see it, and I thought I would ask for rest and a night's lodging here and see what God sent for the morrow. Perhaps the weather would get better. As I draw near, I saw a tipsy old man in a soldier's cloak sitting in the Savalina. I greeted him, saying, Could I perhaps ask someone to give me a night's lodging here? Who else could give it to you but me, he shouted. I am master here. This is a post house, and I am in charge of it. Then, will you allow me, sir, to spend the night at your house? Have you got a passport? Give me some legal account of yourself. I handed him a passport, and, holding it in his hand, he asked me again, Where is your passport? You have it in your hand, I answered. Well, come into the house, said he. He put his speckles on, read the passport through, and said, All right, that's all in order. Stay the night. I'm a good fellow, really. Have a drink. I don't drink, I answered, and never have. Well, please yourself, I don't care. At any rate, have supper with us. They sat down to table. He had the cook, a young woman who had also been drinking rather freely and asked me to sit down with them. They quarrelled all through supper, hurling reproaches at each other, and in the end came to blows. The man went off into the passage and into his bed in a lumber room, while the cook began to tidy and wash up the cups and spoons, all the while going with the abuse of her master. I took a seat, thinking it would be some time before she quieted down, so I asked her where I could sleep, for I was very tired from my journey. I will make you up a bed, she answered and she placed another bench against the one under the front window, spread a felt blanket over them, gave me a pillow. I lay down and shut my eyes as though asleep. For a long while yet, the cook bustled about, but at last she tidied up, put out the fire, and was coming over toward me. Suddenly the whole window, which was in the corner at the front of the house, frame, glass and splinters of wood flew into shivers, which came showering down with a rightful crash. The whole house shook, and from outside the window came a sickening groan, and shouts, and the noise of struggling. The woman sprang back in terror into the middle of the room and fell in a heap on the floor. I jumped up with my wits all astray, thinking the earth had opened underneath my feet. And the next thing I saw was two drivers carrying a man into the house, so covered with blood that you could not even see his face. And this added still more to my horror. He was a king's messenger who had galloped here to change horses. His driver had not taken the turn into the gateway properly. The carriage pole stove in the window, and as there was a ditch in the front of the house, the carriage overturned and the king's messenger was thrown out, cutting his head badly on a sharp post. He asked for some water and wine to bathe his wound. Then he drank a glass and cried, Horses! I went up to him and said, Surely, sir, you won't travel any further with a wound like that. A king's messenger has no time to be ill, he answered and galloped off. The drivers dragged the senseless woman into a corner near the stove and covered her with a rug, saying she was badly scared. She'll come around all right. The master of the house had another glass and went back to bed, and I was left alone. Very soon the woman got up again and began walking across the room from corner to corner in a witless sort of way, and in the end she went out of the house. I felt as though the shock had taken all the strength out of me, and after saying my prayers I dropped to sleep for a while before dawn. In the morning I took leave of the old man and set off again, and as I walked I sent up my prayer with faith and trust and thanks to the Father of all blessings and consolation, who had saved me when I was in such great danger. Some six years after this happened, I was passing a convent and went into the church to pray. The kindly abbess welcomed me in the room after the liturgy and had tea served. Suddenly some unexpected guests came to see her, and she went to them, leaving me with some of the nuns who waited on her cell. 
One of them, who was pouring out tea and was clearly a humble soul, made me curious enough to ask whether she had been in the convent long. Five years, she answered. I was out of my mind when they brought me here, and it was here that God had mercy on me. The mother abbess kept me to wait on her cell and led me to take the veil. How came you to go out of your mind, I asked. It was a fright, she said. I used to work at a post house, and late one night, some horses stove in the window. I was so terrified that it drove me out of my mind. For a whole year, my relations took me from one shrine to another, but it was only here that I got cured. When I heard this, I rejoiced in spirit and praised God, who so wisely ordered all things for the best. I had a great many other experiences, I said, speaking to my spiritual father, but I should want three whole days and nights to tell you everything as it happened. Still, there is one other thing I will tell you about. One clear summer's day, I noticed a cemetery near the road, and what they call a pogost, that is, a church with some houses for those who minister in it. The bells were ringing for the liturgy, and I made my way toward it. People who lived around were going in the same way, and some of them, before they got as far as the church, were sitting on the grass. Seeing me hurrying along, they said to me, Don't hurry, you'll have plenty of time for standing about when the service begins. Services take a long while here. Our priest is in bad health and goes very slow. The service did, in fact, last a very long time. The priest was a young man, but very thin and pale. He celebrated very slowly indeed, but with great devotion and at the end of the liturgy he preached with much feeling a beautiful and simple sermon on how to grow in love for God. The priest asked me into his house to stay for dinner. During the meal I said, How reverently and slowly you celebrate, Father. Yes, he answered, but my parishioners do not like it, and they grumble. Still, there is nothing to be done about it. I like to meditate on each prayer and rejoice in it before I say it aloud. Without that interior appreciation and feeling every word uttered is useless both to myself and to others. Everything centers in the interior life and in attentive prayer. Yet how few concern themselves with the interior life, he went on. It is because they feel no desire to cherish the spiritual inward light. And how is one to reach that, I asked. It would seem to be very difficult. Not at all, was the reply. To attain spiritual enlightenment and become a man of recollected interior life, you should take some one text or other of Holy Scripture, and for as long as a period as possible, concentrate on that alone all your power of attention and meditation. Then the light of understanding will be revealed to you. You must proceed in the same way about prayer. If you want it to be pure, bright, and enjoyable, you must choose some short prayer consisting of few but forcible words, and repeat it frequently and for a long while. Then you will find delight in prayer. This teaching of the priest pleased me very much, how practical and simple it was, and yet at the same time, how deep and how wise. I gave thanks to God in my thoughts for showing me such a true pastor of his church. When the meal was over, he said to me, You have a sleep after dinner while I read the Bible and prepare my sermon for tomorrow. So I went into the kitchen. There was no one there except a very old woman sitting, crouched in a corner, coughing. I sat down under a small window, took the philokalia out of the knapsack and began to read it quietly to myself. After a while, I heard the old woman who was sitting in the corner ceaselessly whispering the prayer of Jesus. It gave me great joy to hear the Lord's most holy name spoken often. And I said to her, What a good thing it is, mother, that you are always saying the prayer. It is the most Christian and most wholesome action. Yes, she replied. The Lord have mercy is the only thing I have to lean on in my old age. Have you made habit of this prayer for long? Since I was quite young, yes. And I couldn't live without it, for the Jesus prayer saved me from ruin and death. How? Please tell me about it, for the glory of God and in praise of the blessed power of the prayer of Jesus. I put the philokalia away in the knapsack and took a seat nearer to her and she began her story. I used to be a young and pretty girl. My parents gave me in marriage, and the very day before the wedding, my bridegroom came to see us. Suddenly, before he had taken a dozen steps, he dropped down and died without a single gasp. This frightened me so that I utterly refused to marry at all. I made up my mind to live unmarried and to go on a pilgrimage to the shrines and pray at them. However, I was afraid to travel all by myself, young as I was. I feared evil people might molest me. But an old woman pilgrim who I knew taught me, wherever my road took me, always to say the Jesus prayer without stopping, and told me 
for certain that if I did, no misfortune of any sort could happen to me on my way. I proved the truth of this, for I walked even to far off shrines and never came to any harm. My parents gave me money for my journeys. As I grew old, I lost my health, and now the priest here, out of kindness of his heart, gives me board and lodging. I was overjoyed to hear this, and knew not how to thank God for this day, in which I had been taught so much by examples of spiritual life. Then asking the kindly and devout priest for his blessing, I set off on my way again, rejoicing. Then again, not so long ago, as I was making my way here through Kazan government, I had a chance of learning how the power of prayer in the name of Jesus Christ is shown clearly and strongly, even in those who use it without the will to do so, and how saying the prayer often and for a long time is a sure and rapid way of gaining its blessed fruits. It happened that I was to pass the night at a Tatar village. On reaching it, I saw a Russian carriage and coachman outside the window of one of the huts. The horses were being fed nearby. I was glad to see all this and made up my mind to ask for a night's lodging at the same place, thinking that I should at least spend the night with Christians. When I came up to them, I asked the coachman where he was going, and he answered that his master was going from Kazan to the Crimea. While I was talking with the coachman, his master pulled open the carriage curtains from inside, looked out and saw me. Then he said, I shall stay the night here too, but I have not gone into the hut. Tatar houses are so uncomfortable. I have decided to spend the night in the carriage. Then he got out, and as it was a fine evening, we strolled about for a while and talked. He asked me a lot of questions and talked about himself also, and this is what he told me. Until I was 65, I was a captain in the Navy, but as I grew old, I became the victim of gout, an incurable disease. So I retired from the service and lived almost constantly ill on a farm of my wife's in the Crimea. She was an impulsive woman of volatile disposition and a great card player. She found it boring living with a sick man and left me, going off to our daughter in Kazan, who happened to be married to a civil servant there. My wife laid hands on all she could, and she even took the servants with her, leaving me with nobody but an eight-year-old boy, my godson. So I lived alone for about three years. The boy who served me was a sharp little fellow and capable of doing all the household work. He did my room, heated the stove, cooked the gruel, and got the samovar ready. But at the same time, he was an extraordinary, mischievous, and full of spirits. He was insistently rushing about and banging and shouting and playing, and up to all sorts of tricks, so that he disturbed me exceedingly. And I, being ill and bored, liked to read spiritual books all the time. I had one splendid book by Gregory Palamas on the prayer of Jesus. I read it most continuously, and I used to say the prayer to some extent, but the boy hindered me, and no threats and no punishment restrained him from indulging in his pranks. At last I hit upon the following method. I made him sit down on a bench in my room with me. I bade him say the prayer of Jesus without stopping. At first, this was extraordinarily distasteful to him, and he tried all sorts of ways to avoid it, and often fell silent. In order to make him do my bidding, I kept a cane beside me. When he said the prayer, I quietly read my book, or listened to how he was saying it, but let him stop for a moment, and I showed him the cane. Then he got frightened and took the prayer again. I found this very peaceful and quiet reign in the house. After a while, I noticed that now there was no need for the cane. The boy began to do my bidding quite willingly and eagerly. Further, I observed a complete change in his mischievous character. He became quiet and taciturn and performed his household tasks better than before. I was glad of this and began to allow him more freedom. And what was the result? Well, in the end, he got so accustomed to the prayer that he was doing it almost the whole time, whatever he was doing, and without any compulsion from me at all. When I asked him about it, he answered that he felt an insuperable desire to be saying the prayer always. And what are your feelings while doing so, I asked him. Nothing, said he. Only I feel that it's nice to be saying it. How do you mean nice? I don't know how to put it exactly. Makes you feel cheerful, do you mean? Yes, cheerful. He was 12 years old when the Crimean War broke out, and I went to stay with my daughter at Kazan, taking him with me. Here he lived in the kitchen with the other servants, and this bored him very much. He came to me with complaints that the others playing and joking amongst themselves bothered him also, and laughed at him and so prevented him saying his prayer. In the end, after about three months, he came to me and said, I am going home. I am unbearably sick of this place and all the noise. How can you go for such a distance? And in winter too, said I. Wait, and when I go, I will take you with me. 
The next day, my boy had vanished. We sent everyone to look for him, but nowhere could he be found. In the end, I got a letter from the Crimean from the people who were on our farm saying that the boy had been found dead in my empty house on 4 April, which was Easter Monday. He was lying peacefully on the floor of the room with his hands folded on his breasts and in that same thin frock coat that he always went about in my house and which he was wearing when he went away. And so they buried him in the garden. When I heard this news, I was absolutely amazed. How had the child reached the farm so quickly? He started on 26 February and he was found on 4 April. Even with God's help, you want horses to cover 2,000 miles in a month. Why? Is it nearly 70 miles a day and in thin clothes without a passport and without a far thing in his pocket into the bargain? Even supposing that someone had given him a lift on the way, still that in itself would be a mark of God's special providence to care for him. The boy of mine, Mark you enjoyed the fruits of prayer, concluded this gentleman, and here I am, an old man, still not as far as he. Later on I said to him, It is a splendid book, sir, the one by Gregory Palamas, which you said you liked reading. I know it, but it treats rather of the oral prayer of Jesus. You should read a book called the Philokalia. There you will find a full and complete study of how to reach the spiritual prayer of Jesus in mind and heart also, and taste the sweet fruit of it. At the same time I showed him my Philokalia. I saw that he was pleased to have this advice of mine, and he promised that he would get a copy for himself. And in my own mind I dwelt upon the wonderful ways in which the power of God is shown in his prayer. What wisdom and teaching there was in the story I had just heard. The cane taught the prayer to the boy, and what is more, as a means of consolation, it became a help to him. Are not our sorrows and trials which we meet with on the road of prayer in the same way the rod in God's hand? Why then are we so frightened and troubled when our Heavenly Father in His fullness of His boundless love lets us see them, and when these rods teach us to be more earnest in learning to pray, and lead us on to consolation which is beyond words? When I come to the end of things, I had to tell. I said to my spiritual father, Forgive me, in God's name. I have already chatted far too much, and the Holy Fathers call even spiritual talk me babble if it lasts too long. It is time I went to find my fellow traveller to Jerusalem. Pray for me, a miserable sinner, that of his great mercy God may bless my journey. With all my heart I wish it, dear brother in the Lord, he replied. May all the all-loving grace of God shed its light on your path and go with you, as the angel Raphael went with Tobias.